Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the program that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Now, have you heard of Robert Henderson and his teaching about how you can apparently file lawsuits in the court of heaven uh, that uh, it, these are like counter lawsuits that you can file in the court of heaven so that you can undo the lawsuits filed against you by the devil, which is keeping you from having money and stuff. Yeah, if you've never heard of that, go ahead and hit the uh, subscribe button down below. Don't forget to like the video and to ring the bell so you can be notified when we update the channel. Now, a little bit of a note here. I'm, I'm looking at my notes and... Um, we, we got some Bible to do today. Uh, so I, I think this might be a long segment, but usually my segments are long anyway. Just want to let you know that. So if you know anybody that is uh, wrapped up in this Robert Henderson Courts of Heaven teaching, it's making all the rounds and the charismatics are all buying into it. Um, this is not a teaching. It's not taught in the Bible. Nowhere are we instructed to go to heaven to file lawsuits and stuff. In fact, what I'm going to do here uh, to start off, uh, I didn't intend to start this way, but I'll do it this way. Uh, let's go to the Jim Baker Show. One of the first programs for this year, uh, 2020, Jim Baker had Robert Henderson on his program. And see if you can recognize the religion that he's describing, because this is not biblical Christianity. I don't, I don't know what this is, but... Uh, this is all supposedly has something to do with Robert Henderson. So let me move that over there. Let me make it just a little bit smaller so that I can fit it into the screen there. There we go. Yeah, listen to what Jim Baker says. When Robert uh, Henderson, you were here last, you talked about the courts of heaven. Yes. Oh, it was such a yeah, good show. You. I've had more people comment on that. True. Awesome. And uh, I just want to cry because I w was having a, a, a really warfare mm -hmm. a need mm -hmm. and i have i have never prayed to the courts of heaven um have any of you prayed to the courts of heaven where in scripture are we told to pray to the courts of heaven scripture is clear there's one mediator between god and men and that's jesus christ and he happens to be the god man so what is this teaching? And it, 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 listen to what he, what else he says. And here. I went to the courts. Mm. Well, actually, I, you, you were probably having a flashback. Yeah, you did go to the courts, and the judge said guilty and then sentenced you to prison. Yeah, it, I'm sure that's just a PTSD moment for him. After you left. Yeah. And I prayed earnestly. When right there, I could feel, you know, the, it's supernatural yes. real. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He felt it, man. The, the courts are supernatural real, man. What is this religion? By the way, you're going to find in the Bible, the, the same part of the Bible that talks about praying to the courts of heaven. Yeah, that same part of Scripture, you, you, that's the same section you'll find praying to the Virgin Mary and praying to um, St. Teresa, uh, other saints, as well as the, uh, the, all the instructions found in the Bible, like if you're trying to sell a piece of property and it's not selling, to go and buy a, a statue of St. Joseph, bury it in your front yard, do a little ritual, and then your house will sell. Yeah, the, the same part the, in the Bible that has all that stuff is the same part that you'll find praying to the courts of heaven. And God answered that unbelievable prayer request Amen. when I went to the courts. Amen. And I don't go to the court every time. I don't, I don't go every time. What is this religion? What is this? I just don't do it. I, I know God. Mm -hmm. And and I want to go. I probably could go every day, but I just don't want to be a tr <laughs> troublemaker. You, know? you don't want to be litigious. No, spiritually litigious. That would be bad. <laughs> I just, I want to, I take the big, the big stuff, you know. Uh, what do you think of that? Am I okay doing oh, that? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Am I okay if I don't go to the courts every day? I, I've never been to the courts of heaven once. Never filed a lawsuit in the courts of heaven once. Nowhere in the Bible am I told to file a lawsuit in the courts of heaven. 
So where does this teaching come from? By the way, that's uh, Mr. Robert Henderson there. Well, what we're going to do here, we're going to head over to the brand new It's Supernatural Network. Yeah. Um, and uh, you'll note that on February 3rd, 2020, uh, at the It's Supernatural Network, that was started by Sid Roth. Uh, there's a there's a program there, and uh, and Robert Henderson shows up, and he's being interviewed. Uh, the name of the program, I think, is something more. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'll show up on Fighting for the Faith with some regularity in the future. Uh, but the, the the episode is expediting your prayers from the courts of heaven with Robert Henderson, and we're gonna tear this thing down. We're gonna break it down and show you. This ain't what the Bible says, and the fundamental presuppositions behind this doctrine, oh, they are way off, way, 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 way off. So with that, let's get to it, and uh, he, let's uh, let the program explain. Here we go. Welcome, friends. This is Something More, and I'm Dr. Keenan Bridges, and I have a very special guest today, uh, a very powerful ambassador for a message that all of us need to hear. We have Apostle Robert Henderson, welcome to the. Uh, uh, who? What? What ecclesiastical office does Robert Henderson hold? Yeah, notice he uh, called him Apostle Robert Henderson. There ain't no apostles today, not one. And Robert Henderson surely is a false apostle. How do I know? Because he couldn't ha rightly handle a biblical text to save his life. But uh, let's keep going. Show. It's great God to God bless here. you. God bless you. You know, you've, you've really um, come to be known as sort of this, this messenger of this kingdom message of the courts of heaven. You know, you've written about it. You've taught about it. Now, real quick, until very recently, can you name the church fathers, you know, the, the Christians who taught about the courts of heaven? Did any of the church fathers write about it? If you come to think of it, did any of the real apostles of Jesus write and talk about us entering the courts of heaven to file lawsuits and stuff? No, this is a brand new teaching. And listen, this is the, you know, Christianity is a faith once delivered to the saints. This, if this doctrine wasn't taught by the apostles clearly and explicitly, it's brand new and has no place in the body of Christ. No place whatsoever. You're going all over the world with this message. Tell us a little bit about kind of how you came to this and, and why this message is so important for the body. Well, it started off with my own personal need. Uh, that I, I've always been a man of prayer since 1980. Wonderful. But for the, for the first time in my life, I, my prayers were, weren't getting any, any results. The wow. answers weren't coming. Now, I'm <clears throat> going to put this out here. When you pray, does God always say yes to your prayers? That's the question. Does God always say yes? The answer is no. So you're going to note here that he's assuming that no means he's not getting results and that he hasn't received an answer to his prayers. God has every prerogative to say to your petition, no, no. In fact, there are also biblical texts that make it clear that certain prayers go unanswered. Let me give you that to start off with. So if we take a look at like James chapter 4, James chapter 4, um, let me find it here. Let's, there we go. James writes, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire, you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So um, <laughs> you'll note here that the Bible actually talks about full-on instances where God will not answer your prayer with a yes he will not he will answer your prayer with a no way jose for particular reasons so just because god has said no to you does not mean that you have not received an answer to god so the whole premise behind the um 
the uh, courts of heaven thing is, is that he was looking for an effective way of getting the answer he wanted. And notice that God saying no is not on his radar. Yeah, let me let me uh, get there and back that up just a smidge, and you can hear Word that. For the body. Well, it started off with my own personal need uh, that I, I've always been a man of prayer since 1980. Wonderful. But for the for the first time in my life, I, my prayers were, weren't getting any any results. The wow. answers weren't coming. And I had a son that was that was in deep depression that had been in ministry. Um, and what happened was I couldn't get him out of it. I'd prayed for him for like two years. Mm. And the old style, if you will, what I, what, what I would say the traditional realm of spiritual warfare. I was yeah. binding. I was loosing. I yeah. was opening. I was shutting. I was. You see, that that's not prayer. Yeah. Binding, loosing, commanding, controlling, opening, shutting is not prayer. Now, a little bit of a note here. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at another biblical text, and we'll look at Luke uh, chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, and we'll, we'll note uh, what Jesus says. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and Forgive us our sins, as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. So you'll note when Jesus taught us to pray, this is called the Lord's Prayer, and if you don't attend a church where you actually pray this prayer, you, you might not be in a good church. Uh, it, this is a daily prayer that I pray, although I pray the extended version of it, if you would. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So you know that in praying this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, Jesus didn't say, and I command your kingdom to come, and I command that the devil depart from me so I do not be led into temptation, and I bind, and I loose, and I... That, by the way, binding, loosing, commanding, decreeing, and controlling, that's not prayer. That's wackerdoodleism. Jesus teaches us to humbly submit our petitions to God and pray in his name and according to his will. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why Robert Henderson's not getting his prayers answered is he's not praying. That's the that's the basic problem here. So I think you can see that. And let's go back to the video real quick. Yeah. And what I'll do is I'll back this up just a little bit and listen to what he says. Again, this isn't prayer. Um, and what happened was I couldn't get him out of it. I'd prayed for him for like two years. Mm. And the old style, if you will, what I, what, what I would say the traditional realm of spiritual warfare. I was yeah. binding. I was loosing. I yeah. was opening. I was shutting. I was yeah. doing everything I knew to do. Yeah. That ain't prayer. And after two years, and nothing was getting better, it was only getting worse. Wow. And I after... can only imagine because God's not actually hearing from you. You're not asking him for every, anything. No, notice what uh, James said. <clears throat> Let me find that again here. James 4, you, um, you do not have because you do not ask. The text does not say you do not have because you do not command or decree or declare. It says, ask, 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 you petition, you ask him. He's God, you're not, you're a creature, you know, and you, you do not have authority, you're not a God. So you go to God and you humbly ask, okay? Doesn't say command, control, decree, declare, or any of that nonsense. So no wonder his prayers weren't being answered. He wasn't even praying. For two years, uh, one morning I went to prayer and I heard the Lord whisper to me, bring him to my courts. Wow. And <laughs> All right, so now he's claiming direct revelation. So where does this doctrine really come from? The doctrine of going into the courts of heaven in order to get your prayers answered begins with a the claim of a direct revelation from God, not with a biblical text. 
See, the reason why Christians historically have never practiced going to the courts of heaven, never prayed to the courts of heaven, is because the Bible doesn't teach this doctrine. So he claims a direct revelation. God said, take it to the courts. Okay. And so I, I thought, well, I think I know how to begin this. So I began the process, and, and I won't go into the whole process, but it took me... There, there's a process? Where's the process taught in Scripture? A process of taking a prayer to the court of heaven. Where is this process laid out? Step one, fill out form number 7480. Make sure you fill it out in triplicate. You know, make sure the goldenrod copy goes to the lady at the front desk. You keep the, the pink one for yourself. And the white one gets filed with angel so-and-so. Where in the Bible does it teach a process for filing a lawsuit or prayer or petitioning the courts of heaven. No biblical text teaches this. About 15 minutes to repent for his sins. I'm backing that up. Did he, did he say what I thought he said? I thought, well, I... Th so he's talking about this fellow. Is it his son he's praying for? I think I for? know how to begin this. So I began the process, and, and I won't go into the whole process, but it took me about 15 minutes to repent for his sins. Can you repent for somebody else's sins? Is that possible? And then the Lord said for me to repent for some sins, for some words I had spoken concerning him, mm. that the accuser was actually taking and using against him to build a case. Wow. And then the Lord told me to begin to prophesy his destiny. It took about... Pro so the Lord told you to prophesy his destiny. What is this religion? This is not Christianity. It's not biblical Christianity at all. Fifteen minutes to do all that. Wow. And a week and a half later, my son calls me. Wow. And he says to me, Dad, I don't know what happened. But he said, but a week and a half ago, all hmm. the depression left me. Wow. And I'm now ready to do God's will. Well, <laughs> he's now a senior pastor of a local church, uh, overseeing uh, several other churches in the uh, north, uh, northeast part of Texas and northern Louisiana, wow. and just flourishing in the call that God has for him. Wow. But it all stems back. So, I mean, this, apparently this anecdotal life story and experience proves that the Courts of Heaven doctrine, newly revealed to Apostle Robert Henderson, is what we Christians need to be doing. Uh-huh. To God helping me go into the courts of heaven and, and see those things against him broken. And I tell people, mm. I tell people that I did, I did in 15 minutes in the courts of heaven what I had not been able to do in two years wow. on the battlefield. He's selling you something. This is not a biblical doctrine. If it were, Christians would have been going to the courts of heaven for the last 2,000 years. Wow, wow. You know, wow. You, you, this is amazing. Uh, you no, it's not. What's amazing is you think that this is actually what God wants us to do. You talk about the legality of the spirit realm and how, you know, most... Where in the scripture can we talk about the legality of the spirit realm? Believers, we're, we're ignorant. I mean, we think of prayer as sort of, uh, you know, Father, lay me down to sleep. I pray <laughs> the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, that kind of ideology. But you... That's not an ideology. That's a prayer you teach children. And it's not even a really good one. I mean, teach your children the Lord's Prayer. Bring a new, a, a sort of a different perspective to this. Yeah, new perspective, new doctrine, new teaching not found in the Bible. It's new, which means it's not true. And really open up a new dimension when you talk about the legal aspect. Could you, could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, you know, when, when the disciples said to Jesus in Luke 11, uh, teach us to pray. Yes. Jesus actually put prayer in three dimensions in the book of Luke. Okay. And Has this man ever taken a course in biblical hermeneutics? Because when you read the book of Luke, there is no reputable New Testament scholar or Lucan scholar who talks about how Jesus took prayer and put it into three dimensions. This is nonsense. And by the way, wait till you see how he's going to try to prove it. We'll do some work in the biblical text uh, here in a minute in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 11, he puts it in two division, uh, dimensions. He puts it in, number one, approaching God as Father. Okay. Because in response... No, it's not about a dimension of approaching God as Father. God the Father, first person of the Holy Trinity, is our Father. And Jesus teaches us to pray, 
our Father who art in heaven. That's a reality that's grounded in the doctrine of the Trinity. Once the disciple, to the disciples' question, Jesus said, uh, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. We yeah. know that. But he was saying you approach God as Father. Yeah. No, he wasn't. You just put words in Jesus' mouth. That's not what he was talking about if you're talking about dimensions, because watch where he goes next. But in, in Luke 11, 5 through 8, he says, and which of you having a friend? And he begins to put prayer in the realm of approaching God as friend. Wow. Yeah, no, that's not how that works. Um, let's take a look at that text real quick. So Luke chapter 11, we'll start at verse 5. And so we, we've already noted that Luke chapter 11, early on, Jesus went, said, when you pray, say, Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So yeah, we're taught by Jesus to pray to God the Father. This is most certainly true. This isn't a dimension. This is a reality regarding the person of the Father who is, you know, the you know, the first person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ the Son being the second, Holy Spirit being the third. All of that being said, there's still only one God. The doctrine of the Trinity is clearly taught in Scripture. But Luke eleven five 5 is not teaching us now about the dimension of praying to God as friend. Listen to what Jesus says. So he said to them, Jesus said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer him from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Does that sound like God? You know, so there's God in heaven, and he's teaching us to, to pray to him in the realm of friend or the dimension of friend. And so God is our friend. Is He's in bed, and he's sleeping. And so we come to God in prayer, Lord, I need your help. And God says, I'm sleeping. Leave me alone. Go away. Come back in the morning when it's when it's light. And you go, but but I need your help now, God. I need your help now. And it's this is, you see, the point of that Jesus is making is, is that God isn't like this at all. <laughs> okay. The reason why the fellow got what he needed is because of his persistence, his impudence. Uh impudence. Sorry, I pronounced that wrong. <laughs> yeah, that could go. That could be weird. Anyway, he, you get the idea. So I so he says, I tell you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Jesus is saying God isn't like that, friend. And notice what Jesus said. Ask. He didn't say command, control, decree, declare. No, he said ask. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. So the point that Jesus is making is is that God isn't like this friend at all who will only re, who will only give in when pressured in the middle of the night and embarrassed whereas God will Jesus says ask and you will receive you get the point that that's kind of the point that Jesus so already apostle Robert Henderson's theology here that uh, that uh, Luke 11 is teaching us of the dimension of father and the dimension of friend the friend thing just completely collapsed, completely collapsed. It just a little bit of elbow grease and sound biblical exegesis caused that thing to come right down. Wow, wow. But then in Luke 18, he finishes up the teaching seven chapters later. Wow. And he says that there was in a certain city a judge and a widow that went before this judge. Mm. And through her activity before this judge, she rendered a verdict. And then Jesus said, he said, if, if God, if, if this, if the widow can do this, how much more will God hear the cry of his elect? Okay, so we'll take a look at um, Luke 18. Does Luke 18 teach the dimension of judge? Is that what the point of Luke 18 is? The answer is no, by the way. And, uh, and so here, here's the parable. So Jesus told them a parable. Parables need to be interpreted. And uh, to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So notice what the text says. Keep on praying. Don't stop asking. Don't lose heart. That's what Christ is saying. And here's what he says. So he said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Now, right off the bat, 
Does this judge sound anything like God? No, this is a wicked judge. He is self-serving. He is nothing like God. He's nothing like Jesus at all. And that's kind of the point, is that he's not saying that, that we need to come to God in the dimension of judge. No, the point of this parable is, is that Jesus and that God is nothing like this judge. Again, the setup. Keep praying. Don't lose heart. So there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man. Uh -huh. Again, self-serving judge. Does, does it sound anything like God? No. Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll give her justice so that she will not, she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So he says, hear what the unrighteous judge says. So if Luke 18 is Jesus, us, Jesus teaching us to embrace the dimension of God as judge and there's courts, then, then Jesus is teaching us to embrace the idea that, that God is an unjust judge, that he is an unrighteous judge. Is that what Jesus is saying? No. Okay, so hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he long delay over them? No, of course not. I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So already Robert Henderson's claim of the three dimensions, friend, father, judge, judge and, fr and friend come tumbling down when you just apply sound biblical exegesis to the exact text that he points us to. So his entire doctrine is built on sand. It's not biblical. No one has ever believed this. The, he's a con man. He's selling something, and he's not teaching you how to pray. Like I said, all of his ideas regarding prayer are found in the same chapters that teach us to pray to the Virgin Mary. And there are no biblical texts that teach us, uh, teach us to do that. You get the point. So, by the way, it just kind of as a bonus, um, what we'll do is we'll put a link down to a sermon I preached on Luke 18, titled Wrestling with God in Prayer. I delivered this one back on uh, October 20th of 2019. And, uh, and so I exegete my way through uh, Luke 18 and the unjust judge. So I think you will find that helpful. We'll put a link to it, Wrestling with God in Prayer, down below. Worth a listen because it teaches you something about prayer. It's the thing that Christ was making the point about. I, I think you get the idea. So coming back then to uh, Robert Henderson here, um, he's, um, he's just twisted Luke 11 and Luke 18. There's no such things as he, he, Jesus was teaching us to pray into the dimension of friend and judge and stuff which, by the way, is the foundation of his doctrine. Wow. So he puts prayer in the, in the perspective of approaching God as judge. Wow. So those are the three dimensions, approaching God as father, approaching him as friend, and approaching him as judge. Wow. No, that's a complete twisting of these texts, and I just proved it. Wow. But the judge is the courtroom. That's and knowing good. how to so come good. before him in his judicial system yeah. and grant him the legal right to fulfill his passion. And wait, wait, wait. I have to grant God the legal right to do things? Are you out of your mind? That is ridiculous. On its face, absurd on its face. And answer our prayers. Wow, wow, that's profound. So I want you to go a little deeper into... Robert Henderson's God is utterly powerless. Hi, I, 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 I'm... I'm God the Father. At least I'm in talking to you from the dimension of God the Father. and I really want to help you, and, and I, I want to make you rich, and I want to send money and stuff, but my hands are bound because the, oh, the devil, he, he like filed a lawsuit against you, man, and, and so he's got a legal right to keep the funds from getting to you, man. So I, I need you to file a counter lawsuit so that uh, you can win so that then I can be granted the legal right to help you. But until then, I, I'm stuck. I can't answer any of your prayers. What kind of God is that? 
that's a completely worthless and powerless deity. When we talk, because I want to, there's so much to this, you know, and I want to open it up even more. But you talk about going before the courts of heaven. You know, we might have some viewers that have never heard that concept before. Mm -hmm. and right, because it's not taught in Scripture. Entire lives. Some have, some haven't. I want you to explain what does that mean? How do we go before the courts of yeah, how exactly does one do that? Show me the bi biblical text that explain the procedure. Heaven, I think that's a very uh, important concept. Yeah, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a really normal, average kind of guy. Uh, yeah, you, you, the first words out of your mouth should have been, sure, I'd be happy to show this to you from the book of 1 Corinthians or the book of Romans or Colossians or 2 Thessalonians or something like that. But notice he starts with, I'm a really humble guy. Uh, that's no way to build a biblical doctrine. I'm not, I don't consider myself highly gifted in the spirit. Uh, I know a lot of people. This has nothing to do with you. Show us from the biblical text the procedure for filing a lawsuit in the courts of heaven. People that are very, very prophetic. They have all sorts of encounters with angels yeah. and, you know, go to heaven. And, and yeah. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. And I really draw from those people. But but I'm I'm the kind of guy that when I say going before the courts, it's a it's an activity of faith. Mm. Yeah, it's an activity of faith. That's great. Show me where it's taught in the Bible and the procedures laid out in Scripture. I am just by, I understand from Scripture mm. that there's a court system in heaven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by twisting Luke 18. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And because Daniel 7.10 says the court was seated and the books were open. Yeah. Oh, yeah, see, there it is. Daniel 7.10, man. The court the, was seated and the books were opened. See, you can file a lawsuit in heaven. Three rules for sound biblical exegesis are context, context, and context. How much do you want to bet that when I open up Daniel chapter 7, and it talks about the court being seated and the books being opened, that it's not talking about a lawsuit that you're filing? How much do you want to bet? You guys are chicken. I know you don't want to take that bet. I know you don't want to. Okay, so let's see here. Daniel. No, that's Deuteronomy. Hang on a second here. I better open it up over here. There we go. Daniel 7. There we go. Daniel chapter 7. And we'll, we'll, we'll just start at the beginning of the chapter. So Daniel is writing about a vision that he's having, a dream that he's had. And here's what it says. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed, and then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and the four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, his wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and, I, and, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful, exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And you're going to note here, this sounds a lot like the dragon from the book of Revelation, and the reason for that is simple. Because it's the same being. is that We're talking about the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, the abomination that causes desolation. That's what we're talking about here. So I consider the horns, and behold, there came up another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and the mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And 
the and court sat in judgment and the books were opened. Can you tell me which day the books are opened and the court is set? Answer, the day of judgment. The books being open is a picture of God's judgment. It is the last day. So you, you get the idea here. So I looked, and then because of the sound of the great words, the horn was speaking. As I looked, the beast was killed. Its body was destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. This, the, the court being seated and the books being opened is the day of judgment. So what Apostle Robert Henderson is doing here is absolutely deplorable. He is manipulating God's word to teach that, oh, well, that means that we can approach God in the dimension of judge in the courts. And see, it's because it says in Daniel 7, 10, uh, the court was seated and the books were open. Baha, see, that proves that you can file lawsuits in heaven. No, don't. It just proves that he doesn't know how to rightly handle a biblical text. Yeah, and good. I believe that every time we read about the throne of God, mm. we're not just reading about a place of worship. We're also reading about a place of judicial activity. Wow. Because his throne is established upon righteousness and justice. That's right. So by faith, I just step into the, into the courts of heaven. Wow. You're stepping into something. But it ain't the courts of heaven, that's for sure. And I say, Lord, I'm coming before you as judge. Yeah, that's good. And, and anything legal that the enemy would be using against me to stop my prayers from being answered, I'm desiring for the blood of Jesus to be able to answer those accusations because that's what it says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 and 11, that the accuser is accusing yeah. us before God day and night. Absolutely. And then it says, but he, we overcome him through the blood of the lamb. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is just terrible. <sighs> Told you we we're going to be in a lot of biblical texts today. Sorry, uh, Revelation chapter 12, which by the way is like a, a vital text. Uh, hang on a second here. I, I really should open this up in a Greek text window. Um, yeah, let's go there. There we go. So a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant. She was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, on its head, seven diadems, its tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven, cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days." And now war rose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. So again, note, picture of the day of judgment with the defeat of the dragon, him being thrown down, the accuser finally being silenced forever. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So note here, Revelation 12 is not saying, okay, so enter the courts of heaven by faith and plead the blood of Jesus so that you can break the lawsuit that the devil has filed against you to keep you from experiencing your, your, uh, your prayers from being answered. Both Daniel 7 and Revelation 12 give us a picture of the judgment of God, the final judgment of God, against Satan himself. Oy the word of our testimony and by not loving our lives unto death. You see, that's powerful. You see, when you talk about a testimony, a testimony is something you do in a courtroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's not what that text, that word means in that context. When we talk about a verdict, that's something issued by a judge 
a judge seats upon, sits upon a, a, a bench or yes. a judgment seat. And we see this theme all throughout Scripture. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of the Bible says in Psalms, it says that he set Psalms 138, I've set my word above all my name. Yes. It's and what does this have to do with us filing lawsuits in the courts of heaven? Nothing. It talks about, uh, it talks about that he is the governor of the nations. He's the judge. And so th this is such a powerful, powerful concept. You know, you, you brought up something else that I thought was just fantastic. And I'm very interested in this because I believe that there's a connection between the courts of heaven, as you talk about mm -hmm. in your book, and really where the church is today and how we can. <laughs> so apparently where the church is today has something to do. It's connected in some way to this brand new made up doctrine, you know, chock full of Bible verses taken out of context. No, that's not how that begin works. To advance the kingdom of God. You, you literally talk about wealth. Yes. And the and here it comes. Are you ready? You knew this would go to money, right? Connection between wealth and the courts of heaven. I, I mean, I'm blown away by this teaching. Yeah. But I want you to talk a little bit more about that. Well, you know, um, I believe that any, any realm, any area that we are not getting results in. Again, I point out that God reserves the right to say no to your prayers. That, that's quite often it can, be, it, it can be because something legal is resisting us. Yeah. It could be that, yeah. No, actually, it couldn't. <laughs> no biblical text talks about th something legal that's keeping us from having results in our prayers. You just made that up. Yeah. Uh, because the Bible says that we have an adversary in 1 Peter 5, 8. All right, 1 Peter 5, 8. Let's take a look at that in context before he gets there, by the way. 1 Peter 5, 8. Let's see, I'm in James 4, 1 Corinthians 1. Let's go to 1 Peter 5. There we go, 1 Peter 5. Let's take a look at it in context. Peter writes, Exhort the elders among you as fellow as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, for not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. You're going to note here the context doesn't lend itself at all to what those guys are saying. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you uh, who are younger, be subject to your elders, clothe yourselves all of you with humility toward uh, one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for, your, cares for you. Be sober-minded and be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So, note, this is an encouragement in the face of suffering and persecution that the devil is out there seeking somebody to devour, but you resist the devil in faith. That's what the text is saying. Did you see anything there about the courts of heaven? I didn't see anything about the courts of heaven. Not a thing about the courts of heaven. Oh, maybe it's in the word adversary. But in the context, it has nothing to do with a court, does it? Nope, not at all. So let's see what these guys do with it. And it's the same word used in Luke 18, adversary. And it's the Greek word antidikos, which means one who brings a lawsuit. No, that's just one of the definitions of antidikos. It's decos, by the way, not decos. <clears throat> be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, anti-decos. All right, let's go here. And we're going to show you this word has a few different meanings. One who brings a charge in a lawsuit, an accuser, or a plaintiff. That is one definition. One who is continually antagonistic to another, an en enemy, an opponent. Mm -hmm. And since... 1 Peter 5 is not in the context of a lawsuit. The second definition falls into play here. One who is an antagonist, an opponent, an enemy, not a legal opponent. So uh, what uh, uh, Apostle 
Robert Henderson has demonstrated is that he doesn't know how to read a Greek lexicon and he doesn't know how gr Greek actually works. We continue. You know, hold that thought because this is going to be very powerful. We're going to be we're going to be right back in just a moment. Now, by the way, there's no commercial here, so they'll, when they cut, they're going to come right, come right back. As we talk more about how you can release wealth from the courts of heaven. <laughs> Whoo, man, I got to go up there and release wealth from the courts of heaven. I got to file them lawsuits so I can get some money in my bank account. That's what I've been doing wrong. In just a moment on something more. We'll be right back. We're back with something more, and we have our guest, Apostle Robert Henderson, and he's talking about unlocking, really, kingdom wealth and other powerful resources. Yeah, unlocking kingdom wealth by filing lawsuits in the courts of heaven, nowhere taught in the Bible. From the courts of heaven. And, uh, Apostle, we were talking about last time how you were, you were saying about the court and the relationship between wealth and the courts of heaven, but you said there's another dynamic we also need to know. Yes, when the Bible uses the term uh, adversary yes. in, the, in the Greek, in for both, both, both 1 Peter 5, 8 and also uh, Luke chapter 18, the woman had an adversary yes. uh, that was uh, uh, resisting her. That is the Greek word antidikos, and it means one who brings a lawsuit. No, that's only one of the meanings of the word antidikos. And the second definition is the one that's in play because the context makes it clear. It At least in First Peter 5, it's not talking about a legal adversary. It's talking about an enemy and an opponent. And so the enemy builds cases against us mm. to stop us from... <laughs> See, because antidikos means uh, a legal opponent. That means the enemy files legal things against us. No, it doesn't mean that at all. And again, antidikos has a second meaning. From our destiny, in fact... In, in okay, I got to back that up. ...word antidikos, and it means one who brings a lawsuit. And so the enemy builds cases against us mm. to stop us from our destiny. In fact... In Really? That's the big threat of the devil. He's going to stop me from my destiny. No, the big threat we have is that he's going to deceive us and we're going to end up in hell. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says he builds cases against us seeking to have a legal right to devour us. Wow. Wait, what? He just added to the biblical text. Listen cases again. Cases against us mm. to stop us from our destiny. In fact, in, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, He builds cases against us seeking to have a legal right to devour us. Well, nope, that's not what 1 Peter 5, 8 says. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He just added a whole bunch of stuff to the biblical text that isn't there. He's straight out lying. This is a false doctrine on its face. Wow. And this is in any area. For instance, if people aren't getting healed, even though they've done everything they know to do. Yeah, it might be that God says, no. God does that, you know. People, Christians have been dying for 2,000 years. Maybe it's something legal that the enemy has in the spirit realm that stops. <sighs> Maybe it's something legal. Maybe the angels got the coronavirus and a bunch of them that would be normally helping to assist us in getting our prayers answered are, are have fallen ill and uh, and 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 they've got well diarrhea and nausea and they're not able to function properly and so we need to pray that God would release a, a, a heavenly antibiotic to kill the coronavirus in heaven. Uh huh. Stopping it. But this is also true in wealth. Mm. For instance, how, how, for how long have we been hearing that there's going to be a transference of wealth? Yes. Yeah, ever since I was in the charismatic movement, people have been saying that. You know why it hasn't happened? Because it's not a biblical teaching. That Many God, years. That, yeah, that God's going to bring a transference of wealth so that we have the money we need in our hands, not only to live blessed lives. I believe God does want us to live, live blessed lives. Mm. But also to be able to shape culture so that it, it reflects a kingdom value. Wow. That 
This is nonsense. I, I don't. I do not recognize this religion. This is not Christianity. That literally, we need finances to do that. Deuteronomy eight eighteen says He gives us power to get wealth, that He might establish His covenant uh, in the earth. Deuteronomy 8 is from the book of Deuteronomy. It's talking about the Mosaic Covenant and spoken to the children of Israel in the context of the restating of the Mosaic Covenant, which is a covenant of works. It's a land lease agreement for them to be able to stay in the promised land. It does, it's not talking about us. We're not under the Mosaic Covenant. Earth, In other words, for God's will to be done in the earth and nations to look more like heaven than they do like hell. That's what wow. I say. Wow, that's good. Then... No, there's nothing good about this. This is just straight up false doctrine. We get, we're going to have to have wealth to accomplish that. And so we've been crying for wealth. We've been believing God for wealth. We've been praying for wealth. Maybe be even. Be Are you wealthy enough yet? Uh, the devil's filed lawsuits to keep the money from getting to you, and God's hands are tied. He can't do anything. He wants to get it to you, but he can't until you file a counter lawsuit. In investing for wealth, and yet we've not seen the wealth transfer on that level right, come. Right, right. Well, I believe it could be because the enemy has a legal case against the body of Christ, mm. that he is, he is being able to stand before God's presence, his throne, mm. his court. We need some... Christian attorneys, man, we we got to send them so we can get that money out. And say, I have a legal case that denies the right to be able to transfer the... This man is delusional. This is just straight-up wackerdualism. I, I, I'm beginning to question whether or not the guy is mentally sane. ...wealth into their hand, because he knows if we get the wealth into our hands and we understand what it's for, then we're going to see a real advancement of the kingdom of God come. Wow, wow. Wow, wow, yeah. This is all just nonsense. Complete scubalon. I think you get the point. So the idea here was we just wanted to go right at the heart of the basic foundation of this teaching and demonstrate to you that none of this is biblical. Everything that Robert Henderson teaches regarding going to the courts of heaven is just made up in his head, and it's basically he took a whole bunch of biblical texts and twisted them, and then in, after twisting them, strung them together to create this doctrine. But no Christians have ever believed, taught, or confessed this doctrine, and no Christian martyr has ever died for this doctrine either. This is a straight-up, made-up in Robert Henderson's demented head doctrine, and you should not believe it. And if you have any friends that are believing that they need to go to the courts of heaven because because Robert Henderson, show them this video so that their eyes can be open. Or better yet, work out the biblical text and show them yourself from the Bible how that's not what these texts are saying so that they can be set free from this man's deceptions. Hopefully you found this helpful. If so, all the information on how you can support us is down below at the bottom of the video in the description. We can't do what we're doing here without your uh, financial support. And in the month of February, everybody who supports us by joining our crew at Gunners Made or Above, I will send you a copy of my fine art print, San Clemente Dream. And all the it details are on our webpage at piratechristian.com. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Mm -hmm.